Welcome to this week's edition of This Week in Civil Engineering, also known as TWICE, a weekly news show focused on providing civil engineering professionals with the most important and relevant industry updates. I'm your host for this episode, Anthony Fasano. I'm a civil engineer turned executive coach and speaker and host of the Civil Engineering Podcast. You can find all episodes of This Week in Civil Engineering at twice.news. That's twice, T-W-I-C-E dot news. References to all of the news stories covered will be in the episode show notes, which you can find a link to in the description below. And please be sure to subscribe to the Civil Engineering News playlist to receive weekly episodes. Now it's time for what's happening this week in civil engineering. Now it's time for this week's news. You're about to hear excerpts from the stories referenced. Links to all of the full articles can be found at twice.news. First, let's cover the biggest breaking news stories from this past week that might affect civil engineering companies and professionals. Firstly, researchers test sensors that could speed up construction schedules from Kayla Wiles, Purdue.edu. Purdue University engineers have developed sensors that could safely speed up a construction timeline by determining concrete strength directly on site in real time. Typically, concrete mix designs require testing before implementation on a construction project. Once those mixes have been vetted for use, the mix design cannot be altered without additional off-site testing. The technology that Purdue engineers designed would remove the need for extensive off-site testing by allowing construction contractors to verify the concrete's maturity on-site. The Purdue team is working with Francis A. Wilhelm Construction Company, Inc. to test and compare the technology with traditional commercial sensors installed into a floor of what will be Purdue's five-story engineering and polytechnic gateway complex. They are also testing the sensors and highways across Indiana as part of an effort to better determine when concrete is ready to take on heavy truck traffic. Like commercial sensors, these sensors would remain in the concrete. The sensors provide a more direct measurement of strength by using electricity to send an acoustic wave through the concrete. How concrete responds to particular wave speeds indicates its strength and stiffness. Twelve sensors have been installed into various sections of the Gateway Complex's third floor so that the teams can best understand how well they work compared with commercial sensors in use on the site. This is very interesting work by the Purdue University engineers. EMI is currently seeking an interview with the Purdue team for the Civil Engineering Podcast, which you can find at civilengineeringpodcast.com. Next up, let's look at an interesting story from the United Kingdom. Infrastructure sector urged to embrace technology. Catherine Kennedy, NewCivilEngineer.com. Infrastructure must catch up with more technologically advanced sectors and capitalize on its increased role in the United Kingdom's short and long-term plans, according to a new U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement report. The report, A Systems Approach to Infrastructure Delivery, provides guiding principles and recommendations for the leadership, culture, and organization of infrastructure projects. Among the recommendations is a call for infrastructure to close the gap with sectors that have adapted better to growing complexity and technological change, including oil, gas, and aerospace. With infrastructure at the heart of the United Kingdom's proposed economic recovery plan from COVID-19 and central to the target of net zero carbon emissions by 2050, the report also calls on owners to clearly define a project's outcomes and provide direction across the board. Technology in areas such as communications, transportation, and power generation is also evolving at a pace that is forcing change in the design, integration, and commissioning of infrastructure systems. The industry has fallen behind, and it has the responsibility now to catch up and provide the infrastructure that the public deserves. Next up, U.S. News in Civil Engineering. Federal Transit Award gives Kansas City Streetcar Authority 100% funding for Main Street Extension. Michael Mahoney, KMBC.com. 
The Kansas City Streetcar Authority has received $174 million from a federal transit award from the U.S. Department of Transportation for the Main Street Extension Project. The new award means the Kansas City Streetcar Authority has 100% funding for the 3.5 mile extension of the Kansas City Downtown Streetcar from the existing streetcar end of the line at Union Station to the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Streetcar Chief Tom Jerin said with funding now locked in, construction on the Main Street extension, Union Station South to 51st Street and Brookside will start next year. Jaron said he expects it to be an operation in 2025. In August, it was announced the Kansas City Streetcar Authority had received $50.8 million in federal funding from the U.S. Department of Transportation for the project. Then in September, the Kansas City Streetcar Authority secured $14.2 million in a grant that will be used to fund an extension to the Berkeley Riverfront. It's great to see investments being made in the downtown areas of our cities. Next up, let's head to Louisiana. Key piece of Terry Bond's storm protection approved to start construction. Dan Kopp, homatoday.com. State officials announced Wednesday that construction is moving forward for a major flood protection lock in the Homa Navigation Canal. The $366 million lock serves as the linchpin to Terry Bond's parish's hurricane protection system and aims to protect Homa and other inland communities from Gulf of Mexico storm surges. The Louisiana Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority said it is paying for the project using an alternative financing plan that was approved by the state legislature earlier this year. The plan allows Louisiana Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority, also known as CPRA, to incur debt or issue bonds to pay for flood protection projects. The lock is expected to be complete in May 2024. Officials anticipate phase one of the project to begin next year and phase two will start in 2022. The alternate payment plan will provide money during the second phase of construction until the CPRA receives the resources and ecosystems, sustainability, tourist opportunities, and revived economies of the Gulf Coast states payments. This project will stop saltwater intrusion and will also act as freshwater diversion while allowing marine vessels to come and go. This project will also create jobs in the commercial and industrial industries which will be benefited by the diversity of our oil field, marine, and inland towing businesses. The Homa Navigation Canal Lock Complex is the main anchor and most important structure of the entire 98-mile Morganza to the Gulf Hurricane Risk Reduction Project. It's interesting to see the alternative financing option utilized for this project and think about how options like this might be used going forward if this project is successful. Next up, let's head to Charleston. Charleston gives first green light to Army Corps of Engineers wall plan with adjustments. Chloe Johnson, postandcourier.com. Charleston will move forward with an Army Corps of Engineers plan to repel hurricane surge, including a wall around most of the downtown peninsula. In a letter to the Corps, Mayor John Tecklenburg said Charleston will not pursue an independent plan for hurricane protection. This means Charleston has tacitly agreed to proceed with the Corps proposal. It is the most ambitious to date to protect the historic low-lying city from flooding and also the most expensive. Early cost estimates are around $1.75 billion. An 8-mile wall would reach as high as 8 feet off the ground. A breakwater would slow waves below the peninsula's southern point. Five pumps would push rainfall outside the perimeter. And in some areas, the Corps calls for non-structural measures, which may mean retrofitting flood-prone homes or removing them altogether. Charleston would pay 35% of the total price, or an estimated $600 million. But the city does not have to pay that amount by itself. The state or private interests may contribute if Charleston persuades them. In fact, the whole project is dependent on congressional action to approve the 65% federal share, which may not come for years. And depending on how long that takes, construction and material costs could rise. There certainly seems to be a pattern of hurricane and flood protection in the news this week, it's good to see proactive planning for you. All right, let's take a quick break from the news for this week's civil engineering career inspiration. 
Today I'd like to share a tip that you might consider for this upcoming year. I've interviewed countless successful civil engineering professionals, and there is one thing in common with many of them. Not only do they volunteer and get involved with professional associations like the American Society of Civil Engineers or the Institution of Civil Engineers, but they get active and they volunteer for leadership roles in these organizations. They might coordinate an event, chair a committee, or take on a new initiative. It's their experience as well as the relationships that they build through these leadership positions that truly takes their careers to the next level. So I challenge you to become more active in professional associations in 2021. You'll not only boost your engineering career, but you will build many rewarding relationships. All right, let's get back to the news. Next, let's move on to some international news in civil engineering from this past week. First up, we're headed to the United Kingdom for an interesting story. Geotechnical modeling software advances design work on high-speed two-rail project. Peter Reina, ENR.com. A team of New Zealand-based software designers that brought digital 3D modeling to engineering geotechnics less than two years ago recently launched an upgrade to their software, which is now being used on some major projects including the United Kingdom's multi-billion dollar London-Birmingham High Speed Railroad, also known as HS2. The ground modeling and management software is a bit like building information modeling, or BIM, but for the subsurface, says Daniel Wallace, Chief Revenue Officer of Christchurch based Sequent Limited. Still new to construction, the software is being used mainly on large projects, though it's steadily being adopted for increasingly small projects. Sequent was in the mining market with its implicit modeling based algorithm when engineers at United Kingdom based Mott McDonald Group saw its potential for construction, says Peter Fair, a modeling specialist with the design firm. When the engineers approached Sequent in 2015, we mobilized a research team with them, says Wallace. The result of that collaboration was the modeling software called LeapFrog Works, which launched in early 2018. To manage and share the models, Sequent later put its central platform on the market. Upgrades to both these products were launched this month. The algorithm understands geology. It looks at the data and gives the best interpretation. One of the biggest applications of LeapFrog Works and Central is on the geotechnical design part of HS2, which had its formal work start this spring. The software is allowing evolving geotechnical data to be shared almost in real time among some 200 people designing time-critical elements such as tunnel portals. It's exciting to see more and more software systems developed to help with the complex engineering challenges of today's built world. Next up, an interesting story about construction of a floating underwater tunnel linking Scotland and Northern Ireland. Floating underwater tunnel proposed as alternative Irish sea link. From Catherine Kennedy, NewCivilEngineer.com. A floating underwater tunnel linking Scotland and Northern Ireland has been put forward as an alternative to Prime Minister Boris Johnson's bridge proposal. The tunnel would run from Port Patrick in Scotland to near Larney in Northern Ireland, 50 meters below the surface of the sea. A team from Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh has been working on the concept which involves the creation of a submerged floating tube bridge. This would be anchored to the seabed and tethered to pontoons on the surface. Cars could either drive through the tube or use a shuttle train, cutting the current two and a half hour ferry journey to 40 minutes. The feasibility of a bridge or tunnel between the two countries will be considered as part of an independent review into United Kingdom transport connections led by Network Rail Chair Sir Peter Hendy. The review will look at how to boost transport infrastructure throughout Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and England via road, rail, and air and across the Irish Sea. Final recommendations are due to be published in summer 2021. Very interesting, a submerged floating two bridge. EMI is currently seeking an interview with the design team for the Civil Engineering Podcast, which you can find at civilengineeringpodcast.com. On that note, let's finish up with a few infrastructure-related stories. Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority, LVCVA, enables boring to proceed with underground transit system. From Richard N. Veloda, ReviewJournal.com. The Boring Company, 
Elon Musk's tunnel burrowing subsidiary that hopes to build a valley-wide underground transit system received the clearance it needs to proceed. The Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority Board of Directors approved the elimination of a non-compete zone for the Las Vegas monorail, which will allow Boring to develop a 15-mile network of tunnels that would link Strip and downtown Las Vegas resorts with McCarran International Airport and Allegiant Stadium. Boring plans to build the system at its own expense with stations paid for by resorts that want them. Boring would then operate the system, but the company hasn't indicated what fares would be or how much it expects to invest in the system. The non-compete zone was located on the east side of the strip between Sahara and Tropicana Avenues. The Boring system, which the company is calling the Vegas Loop, traverses a portion of the zone. While taking possession of the non-compete agreement was a major reason for acquiring the monorail, the Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority still plans to operate the 3.9-mile electric transportation system when there's enough visitor demand to make it feasible. Bills to allow Michigan municipalities to enter public-private partnerships for infrastructure work clears Senate committee. From Chris Galford, TransportationTodayNews.com. Under new legislation sponsored by a bipartisan group of Michigan lawmakers, the state could allow municipalities to enter public-private partnerships as an added means to update aging infrastructure. The bills, SBs 1215 through 1218, were introduced by State Senators Horn, Republican from Frankenmuth, Moss, Democrat from Southfield, and Schmidt, Republican from Traverse City, and were approved by the Michigan Senate Economic and Small Business Development Committee earlier this month and will next be considered by the full Senate. If enacted, the legislation would allow municipalities to engage with private investment to help manage local bridges with a particular eye on Bay City, Michigan, where two aging bridges have proven to require repair costs far in excess of what the local government can pay. At stake with bridges, like those being dealt with in Bay City, is that even temporary closures can cause massive backlogs in terms of traffic, volume, and prove a detriment to public safety and the regional economy, according to Bill supporters. This proposed public-private partnership for Bay City's Bascule Bridges creates an opportunity for the municipality to divest itself of a long-term liability while providing a private investment opportunity that includes funding mechanisms for future repairs. Given the estimated cost of repairs for a minimum of $30 plus million, it is evident that a public-private partnership is the only option for the community. To wrap up this episode, I'd like to share an inspiring quote to motivate you from Vernon McClellan to really bring you into the next year. What the new year brings to you will depend a great deal on what you bring to the new year. So what will you bring to 2021? There you have it. That's what's happening this week in civil engineering. You can find references to all the stories mentioned at twice.news. And all episodes are published here on our YouTube channel. This is Anthony Fasano signing off. We'll see you next week on This Week in Civil Engineering. In the meantime, go and be the best civil engineering professional you can be.